What does it mean to deny yourself and take up your cross? Jesus talks about this in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's repeated in Mark 8:34, Matthew 16:24, and Luke 9:23. In Mark 8:34, it says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24 says basically the same thing. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Once again, it says it in Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. This lesson is repeated also in Matthew and Luke. We see it in Matthew 10, 38. He says, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He also echoes this same sentiment in Luke 14, 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I had posted this scripture, Mark 8, 34, a few weeks ago on my Instagram and my Facebook, and I was actually really, really shocked to find how many people wanted me to make a video about this scripture. It was so greatly requested that I did. I put something together to help you guys out and go over this scripture and find out what it means. So a lot of people on my channel are brand new to Christianity. Some people are at different walks in their walk with God. And some of this you might know, but for those of you that don't, for the sake of the newbies, the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which basically means that they are the eyewitness testimonies that are very similar. They have a lot of the same content. They share a lot of the same stories but each one is slightly different from the other. I'm going to go over what leads up to Jesus saying this and expressing this. I recommend reading each chapter because one greatly edifies the other. It, it can be repetitious in parts, but I mean, that's why they're eyewitness accounts. They are gonna be a little repetitious, but each one is kind of beautifully synced up to the other and expound upon another, especially Luke. Luke does go into a lot more detail, especially in Luke chapter nine about this. For the purposes of explaining this chapter and these verses, I am going to focus on Mark chapter eight. To understand what Jesus is saying and why, we are going to read the passages around Mark 8, 34. We're gonna see what prompted Jesus to say this and teach these things. We're gonna start in verse 31. It says, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. So let's focus first on Peter rebuking Jesus. Like who does that? Who rebukes God? Can you imagine? And then we're going to focus on how Jesus rebuked Peter. The definition of rebuking or to rebuke is an expression of sharp disapproval or criticism. So that's what Peter was doing to Jesus. And that's what Jesus was doing right back to Peter. I do remember a while ago that when I first read these passages, I was actually really confused at Jesus's reaction to Peter. I mean, after all, Peter didn't want his friend to die. <laughs> Peter didn't want anything bad to happen to his friends. He thought he was doing something honorable in protecting Jesus. And in our 21st century mind, I mean, for me, that, that made sense to me. In our modern minds, in our modern way of thinking, we strive to protect. We think that that is the honorable thing to do. We want to avoid discomfort and we want our loved ones to avoid any harm that would come their way or any discomfort that might come at them as well. We want to protect and guard, but in reality, that's just not always the right thing to do. We see this in Jesus's extremely strong response to Peter 
by telling him to get behind him Satan, for he is not setting his mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus said in John 10, 18, that he voluntarily lays down his life on his own. Nobody takes his life from him. He has the authority to lay it down and he has the authority to take it back up again. Peter did not see the overall mission and why Jesus had to come. So to oppose that mission was to oppose God. I tend to lean towards the view that Jesus wasn't actually literally calling Peter Satan possessed in this passage. He wasn't saying that Peter was literally Satan. Satan, Satan, means adversary. I believe that Jesus is using that word here to show that Peter is unknowingly being used by Satan. He's unknowingly opposing God and speaking for Satan. Peter, the apostle, the disciple to Jesus Christ, unknowingly was opposing God and helping Satan's agenda. Now don't miss this because this is important. How did that happen? How did Peter get into that mindset of opposing God? Watch what Jesus says to him. He says, you're not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. So check it out. Right before this exchange, if we look in Matthew 16, we're going to see this expounded a little bit more, which is why it's a great idea to go read the other chapters, because it really does sync up very well together and gives us more information on what's being said. In Matthew 16 and verses 13 through 17, we see that Jesus is very pleased with Peter. He's happy with him because God had revealed to Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. I love these verses. Let's read them. It says, we're starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. And this is awesome. Check this out. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I have always loved this scripture. It's a beautiful example of how we see and define Jesus. Who do you say that he is? Is he a good man? Is he a mystic? Is he an angel? Is he one of many gods? Is he the Christ consciousness? Is he just a good person? So Peter's response is very significant. It was approved by Jesus. And it says that God revealed this to him. This was God's revelation. This was something that was in line with God. So it's interesting because right after this, Jesus harshly rebukes him. So much so to the point that he puts his words in line with Satan's, the adversary to Jesus. What Peter said did not line up with what Jesus taught, even if it felt right to him, which is really important. What Peter said contradicted Jesus's words and his teachings. This is probably why when I first read these passages, it confused me so much. I thought that what Peter was doing was honorable as well. As somebody who was brand new to the Bible at that time and, and reading it, in my mind, I thought that was a good thing, that Peter was trying to take care of his friend. He was trying to warn him. He was trying to prevent him from the suffering. But the things that man thinks about are so below where God's mind is, and we miss that sometimes. So looking at the passage again, it says, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Peter's way of thinking was not in line with God's way of thinking, but with man's. His thinking was carnal, it was fleshly, and he called him Satan for it. Satan can take advantage of this. Was Peter's heart sincere? Yes. But was it correct? According to Jesus, absolutely not. A sincere heart and human thinking don't always go well together. And Peter had just gone from viewing things from God's perspective to man's perspective. There's a lesson here for all of us when we focus on earthly things instead of heavenly things. Peter's view of Jesus' role was distorted. He wanted to view Jesus as some sort of powerful figure, a military figure, perhaps somebody who was going to come and rescue them from the Romans, which was what a lot of the people thought of Jesus at the time. He did not see him necessarily as a servant to mankind. And this is how a lot of people see him today as well. A lot of people back then expected this grandeur of the Messiah. They expected him to come in this 
flashy, shiny, powerful king way, but they definitely didn't see a suffering servant. This is gonna sound kind of silly, but what this reminds me of is Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. <laughs> There's a scene at the end of the movie where Indiana Jones gets to the end where the Holy Grail is supposed to be. There's the knight and in comes the bad guys. And Julian Glover was the actor who was playing Walter Donovan in the movie. And he goes around and he's looking at all these beautiful cups. They're made out of gold and diamond studded and have jewels all over them. And he asks the doctor, well, which one do you think it is? And of course she picks up the most beautiful one she can find. Come to find out it's the wrong one. It was not, you know, the one that they thought it was. But then Indiana Jones walks up and he's looking at all of them and he finds the dirtiest, grotiest, plainest looking one. And he says, now that's the cup of a carpenter. I love that line because people have such a odd view of Jesus sometimes. When he came in the first century, he came to serve others. He came as a human. When he comes back again, he's gonna come back as a king in glory and power. Peter wanted the shiny, clean, golden Messiah. A lot of them did. He didn't want the cup of a carpenter. So with this kind of as a background, now we have our context to see what leads up to the rest of the passage. Jesus then tells his disciples the point of him coming as the Messiah, the son of man was to suffer many things. He was to be rejected by the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees. Then three days later, he was gonna rise again. This was his mission. And he gives a sort of caveat, if you will, for those who choose to follow him. Let's read it again. Uh, this is right after Jesus tells Peter, his mind is on the things of man and rebukes him. And verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So again, if we're going to go in order, the series of events was that Jesus was talking to his disciples and asking them, who do you say that I am? Peter responds, you are the Christ. Jesus then goes on to say that he's to suffer many things, that as the Messiah, he's to suffer. And then he's going to die at the hands of the religious leaders and then he's gonna rise again. After that, when hearing this, Peter doesn't think that's a good idea. He takes Jesus aside, rebukes him, and then Jesus responds with his harsh rebuke. After that is whenever he starts talking about those who want to follow him, about denying yourself and picking up your cross and following him. Here's some more interesting perspective. Back in those days, the cross was by far one of the most excruciating ways to die. In fact, the very word excruciating originates from the Latin word excruciare and cruciar, which means to crucify. It was an unrelenting instrument of death. So when Jesus is saying to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow him, he's saying to die to yourself and live for him. Following Jesus is not an easy road. It's, it's not a comforting thing all the time. There are times that we look to our heart, our mind, and think that that's what God wants, when in reality, that's just not always the case. You're picking up your cross, dying to yourself, and giving it to Jesus. This is what he wants. He wants all of you. It's a one-way ticket, but it's not a flashy, fancy life that's filled with all your creature comforts and everything that you want all the time. The Christian life is a sacrificial life. Denying yourself means confirming Jesus, which a lot of people think that denying yourself means self-denial, which is different. Self-denial typically means that you're giving up some sort of activity or habit for some sort of period of time, for maybe an occasion. Denying yourself means saying no to the things that take you away from Jesus and the truth of the gospel, things that take you away from his truth. The definition of deny means to refuse or grant something requested 
or desired to someone. So to deny yourself means to refuse to give or grant yourself what you desire and instead turn towards what God desires. Jesus then says, whoever loses their life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. This is dying to yourself. This is laying down your dreams, your desires, your wants, and picking up God's will for your life. Losing your life does not mean a physical loss, but a conscious choice to put aside your lordship of your life and make Jesus Lord instead. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 5.24 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. Romans 6.6 6 says, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. When we make Jesus the center of our lives, we want what he wants. We desire what he desires. What breaks his heart breaks our heart. You can't live a life that's centered around you and yet know what it's like to give your life to the sake of the gospel, to, to Jesus and to God. To follow Jesus so fervently in this manner is necessary because this is how we find him. This is the essence of what he means to lose your life in order to find it. It's about conforming to the image of Jesus and making him the center of everything in our lives. Our natural human inclination is to make us the center of our existence, but to deny yourself and pick up your cross means making Jesus the center of everything. When a person is willing to sacrifice their time, their comforts, their name, their title, their reputation, everything, even their life, for the sake of Christ, they are demonstrating what it means to deny yourself. To not follow Jesus means to gain the whole world and our desires. But at what cost? Our soul? Your soul? Is that worth it? He says whoever is ashamed of him he'll be ashamed of them. That's kind of a scary thought. I have seen many people who try to think of Jesus as their ticket to heaven, but he's not their Lord. They still live their life for them. The Dictionary of Bible Themes defines self-denial as the willingness to deny oneself possessions or status in order to grow in holiness and commitment to God. The Christian life is one that's not always comfortable all the time. Sometimes doing what's right instead of what's easy or popular, but it's a life of joy and fulfillment. The interesting thing is that the price we pay for truth and the price we pay to follow Jesus is not only worth it, but it's everything. Everything you've ever looked for in life is found in Jesus. There's a reason why he says he is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's everything that we've ever looked for. We have to put our desires and our will and our lives aside and make him the Lord of our life. I really enjoyed making this video. I hope you guys learned a lot from it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you liked this video, consider subscribing. As always, I will have more resources and links in the description of this video for you to further your research. I love you all and God bless you. Thank you so much for watching.